So I've had guys, I've been texting from Australia, Germany, Italy, England, Canada, wanting to know about making a Comanche arrow, Comanche bow. There's not many people know how to make Comanche bows. I'm going to get in and talk about, you know, how I make them now. If it wasn't for bows and arrows, we wouldn't be here. My name is Willie Pika. I am Comanche. Um, I've been making bows and arrows and started learning when I was nine years old. And I got lucky back then that my grandmother knew all the old guys that made bows and I wanted to know. I said, Grandma, who makes bows and arrows? Oh, this guy makes a bow, this guy makes it. And so as she'd go visit, I'd go and sit down and listen to these old guys talk, how they would make them. And it's some of the old ways. So what I'm gonna talk about is pretty much basic, um, you know, uh, arrow making and bow making they made back years ago, okay? That's where I'm gonna go. But through the years, since nine years old, I've been doing this and I kept progressing. And of course, I moved to Wisconsin, still making bows and arrows. The tribes up in Wisconsin learned that I was a bow maker and they would approach me. We need, we wanna bring back bows and arrows. They didn't have any bow makers. I'm talking about Potawatomi's. Uh, Mohicans, Stockbridge Munsees, uh, Ojibwe tribes, uh, Menominee, Oneida. They don't have many bow makers. So they would contract with me to go put on a program, teach them how to make bows and arrows. Of course, most of those, most of those people in Wisconsin were moved from the east. They're eastern Indians. So I'd research what kind of wood they would make them out of. And it was hickory. Hickory's a good bow material, but it doesn't stay like a piece of bow dart. But anyway, I learned how to make that and uh, I would research and I had friends at the Indian Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Can you send me pictures of Mohican bows? They'd do that. Then I'd make a bow that they needed, look just like they would have a year, hundred years ago. So I would sit down and teach them how to do that would make the bow, the string, and some arrows. And then on the last day, let's go shoot them. We can shoot these? Well, yeah, that's why we made them. It was so great. You know, they'd put my articles in the newspaper, their tribal newspapers. That, you know, they learned how to make bows and arrows. Some tribe, I went back three times, put on programs. I'd do a program about four hours a day, every Saturday for six weeks or so, and then we'd be done. But anyway, I got to do that. And then how I really got into it is, um, I would come back and forth. I lived in Wisconsin. I worked at a university and I'd fly back and cut my wood, all my boat art, my Osage orange, and I'd have to pack it up and ship it back to my house up there, okay? But I would do that year after year. That's what I did. And finally, this gentleman come by the C Comanche College. Philip Meyer was his name. He said, where's your bow makers? And he met my brother and um, Juanita Patapone. And um, he said, well, he's in Wisconsin. Well, when's he coming down? My brother said, he'd be here next week. He's coming to cut arrows. You know, okay, I'll be back. Not knowing Philip Meyer was going to write this book, The Sun. And then they bought it for a TV series. It was on TBS, The Sun. It was based on Comanches, this white boy, they kept, had a captive and he learned the Comanche ways. It's a great story. It's on DVD that you can find it. And um, uh, there's books out, but he gave credit to me and my brother. That's where the bow makers, we taught him everything, arrows, how they shot, how they made them. And everything in that movie is pretty correct as far as doing it. And when they were making uh, the movie, this girl was fighting with one guy and she had a bow and she would just beat him. I said, I started yelling, no, that's a $300 bow. Don't beat him with a bow, you know? But they they wanted to buy Comanche bows. So I made a bunch of bows and arrows for them for that movie. It was pretty cool. And um, I had a chance to be on the set of that filmmaking. It was great. It was so much fun. I got set up behind the director and told him, you know, different things. 
And even this quick story, the one scene come up where they were doing a burial scene. They were going to put this body on a horse, but they had a saddle. I tapped the, tapped the director. I said, the time period you're talking about, they didn't have cowboy saddles then. He said, Scott, you throw a blanket on there. So, you know, it's things like that. They try to keep it authentic as they could. I think Walter the Patapon, he was down there all the time teaching them Comanche ways and talk and everything. It was great. So if you had a chance to see, re-see that, um, that was uh, The Sun by Philip Meyer. So that's a pretty good book. But from there, uh, I had some friends that I met, Phyllis Narcomi and her friend. They had a project. They were filming at a class at the OU on videos you know, for TV. They said, we need somebody to practice on. I said, okay, what do you want? Well, you just talk about bows and arrows and we'll film it. Well, they did that. And I said, that's it? They said, yeah. They said, it's yours. Do what you want. I said, what kind of grade? Oh, we got an A for sure. And that video was taken by the Tulsa Library and they put it out. I remember we was talking to Teresa, and it, what, what do you think we'll get? How many hits? She said, oh, a few thousand. She called me up and went there, we're at 8,000. We're at 12,000. I looked last night, 940,000 hits on that thing. Another one's over 400,000. But because of that, also in there, if you clip on, um, it's got a, a address to get hold of me. So I've had guys, I've been texting from Australia, Germany, um, Italy, England, Canada, wanting to know about making a Comanche arrow, Comanche bowl. So it's been a lot of fun. Time consuming on my part, but that's what I love to do. Just like Richard, we can talk all day. But um, uh, I'm going to get in and talk about, you know, how I make them now. So if you have a chance, look at the uh, video. Those are pretty cool. Uh, we're going to be making more as we come up. But um, when I was learning, I would ask this one gentleman, I said, I, I need to make some arrows. What do you make? Dogwood. you got to go find dogwood. And he would tell me where to find them. And <clears throat> I would do that. What you do when you find dogwood, the best place to find dogwood when you're cutting is down in a creek. Go into the creek in the middle. Don't go on the outside because when you get in, in the middle, there's trees around. This shoot will grow straight to the sun, and you find the straightest ones. Okay, and that's why I go cut every year. I'll cut 150, 200, and just cure them out. I'll get them then to take the bark off and bundle them up, let them dry, air dry. I can talk about how they, the Indians, used to make them a long time ago, but. That's what I do, just air dry them, leave them on the side. And then when you cut them, you got the whole shoot, but you got, you know, the branches coming out. Look for the branch that they come out together, right next to each other. That point is where I make the knock because I found out later, the knock where those two branches come out, it's like a burl. It's the hardest and it's not like down here where there's a grain on it. So when you shoot, it seldom splits that area, okay? And he was talking about how they shot them too. They made, would make them thicker up here, but they shot them where you pinched them and then these other fingers pulled them. They did, that's how you'd shoot them. But now people just grab them and shoot. It's up to you. But that's, um, that's how I would cut the dogwood. When I cut them and then I cure them, you're going to find out that uh, the longer they go, you talked about how heavy they are. Um, check this one out. You find out if you make them, they get harder and they get lighter. So you were talking about, you know, the graphite stuff or, you know, the other arrow making. These get really nice to shoot. The other reason I found out, then also they would make grooves on them, okay? The old guys call them blood grooves. 
it'd be on three sides. They would uh, use a tool, something, but I, I get, this is the, just a rib bone. I put a screw through it and I drag it down, okay, on three sides, get it as straight as you can. What that does, it keeps it straight and rigid. Once you straighten them, it stays straighter longer, okay? It goes back to the idea, it's a tin horn effect. That's why they twist the tin horn. It makes it stronger. Same thing with putting the grooves in them. It makes a great shoot and they stay straighter longer. So try that. You can pass it around if you want. I've got other ones. Um, then I start putting points on. The progression for arrows in the beginning when a hundreds of years ago, they start creating arrows, something to shoot to kill animals. Well, what they do? They just sharpen the point. Make it sharp enough for it to shoot into something. Kill it. So they went with just a sharp point. Then they found out they can use bone. So this is the buffalo bone that I cut. I take a long rib, rib bone, split it, then I'll work it down to each side. So that's the second way. The other way, then they went to stone, where they got a piece of stone, and that's another whole engineering thing. How did they know how to get a piece of rock that would chip off to make a point? That's the third way. And then when the um, <clears throat> settlers come in, the white people come in, they started using metal. The one metal they used would be the wagon wheel. But they found out if they took that, it's heavy. So when you shoot it, it dips more faster because it's heavy. Then they said, oh, yeah, look at those little hand saws they, they used. Okay. You take the hand saw, what I've learned how to do is take a chisel and you make your pattern, score it with a chisel, breaks. It's hardened steel. It breaks. And these are like you buy in the store. You can sharpen these to shave with. They are so sharp and they're light. It doesn't let your arrow dip. I sell them to guys and they said, man, I can shoot with that. Yeah, I said, I'll make them to shoot. I said, but that's too pretty to shoot, you know? You can shoot these all day, but man, that's a that's a art right there. So that's the part about the um, the arrows. Oh, the other part is, um, I started making them this style. Comanches always used uh, a long feather, okay? And they didn't have glue, or I had one. Um, is that this one? Where's the one? Yeah. They didn't have glue, so what they would do is, they get their feather, and old man Carney always asked me, he said, how you make arrows? Comanche style or Hollywood style? I said, I make both. But he went, Comanche style is, if you look this, I'll pass this one around, but if you look at it, what they did was they tied the feather down first this way and bent it over so you could pull it forward so it, it stays tighter. And that's why they call it Comanche style, and that's the way this one is. Um, but that's that's one thing they did. They didn't use have glue, so that's how they kept them on. Because if you pull it if you, like that, it, you can pull it down tighter. If you lash it Hollywood style and you pull it forward, it's going to come out. This way it pulls on itself. Uh, the reason I have the white plumes, I'm a descendant of uh, Chief Wild Horse. They said that was his medicine the white plumes. So I always, m most of my arrows have plumes on them. I got a picture of uh, a wild horse and that's what he's holding. I found this picture and uh, had a chance to blow it up and I said, I'm making my arrows just like that since I'm wild horse. So that's why most of you see most of my feathers, they look like that. Then the bow, I'll talk about the bows pretty soon, but that's how basically I would make the arrows. 
a lot of work, like you said, especially going down the creek and looking around when I'm looking for a hundred or so, you got to crawl through brines and everything else. And, you know, it's, I like, the other thing I like to go is wintertime. You don't have those little crawly things around snakes or anything. You get the timber rattlers and water moccasins and stuff. So they're hiding wintertime. Besides, wintertime is the best time the sap goes down. If you cut it right now, a piece of dogwood, it's green. Oh, I don't want green looking arrows. So that's why I cut them in wintertime. And I just bundle them, scrape the bark off, throw them on the side, let them air dry. Keep doing it over and over. What I've been doing this 64 years, I've got many arrows and bows that I made. Matter of fact, I've got bundles like this of broken bows, you know how they break, and I keep them because I heard some of the old guys in peyote meetings, they would lean on them, you know, decorate them and lean on them. So I kept it for whoever might want to do that later. But yeah, it's a it's a pretty good uh, technique you can learn just to make arrow. Now, for the <clears throat> bows, bow dark is probably the best wood. Anybody knows bows and arrows, Bow dark is where you got to go, Osage Orange. How these Indians figured that out a long time ago, which tree was the best, that's a whole new thing, you know, the things they learned. And how do you take this piece of wood and work it down in order to shoot something? They did it. But bow dark, you're going to find out <clears throat> a couple things to go along with that. Uh, Bow dark, you see right now, if you drive around, it's got these big old horse apples, they call them. Okay. The old people would use those too. They're, I read up on it, they're toxic. So they would smash them and spread them around. Bugs don't bother it. They don't like it. It's toxic. Toxic, I know, because I had a problem one time. My hands kept breaking out. And I'd go to the dermatologist, everything, what's that? He looked at it, he said, you're breaking out from something. And I read up on it. Bow dark is toxic. The wood is toxic. It's, you got to be careful. You're sensitive. It will do that. I met a young guy that was making bows. He said, <clears throat> and I started talking about being toxic. He said, yeah, I was making bows and I was rubbing my, I was getting a rash on my face. He said, because I was working and you know, you rub your face. I said, you're allergic to bow dark. I said, oh my, he said, oh my God. He says, okay. But yeah, it, you got to watch the wood. Sometimes it bothers people. But <clears throat> the way they would make them, this is a, this is a basic um, style, like Richard knows. It's just a D shape, okay? Now, we learn how to make that. And Comanches always like to decorate. And they'll do different colors, whatever you want. We make the string. But... Um, the problem is you, when you cut the wood, I, I like to cut pieces about six, eight inches round because I do it old style because back then they didn't have chainsaws. Then you got to split it and then you work it down. But what you try to do, and I've done different techniques, but you try to get that one grain that runs all the way across. Once you find that, then you start shaping the side, then you work on the rest of it, on the belly, on the inside. That's where your shape come from. And like Richard said, you gotta be able to learn how to maneuver this because you don't want a bow that looks like this. You gotta shape it where they bend the same on both sides. And I try to, I've made some beautiful bows recurved and back. I said, no, nah, there's not many people know how to make Comanche bows. So I backed up. That's all I make now. Short bows. Well, short bows. This is short. This is probably 48 inches. I've seen them as 36, 42 inches. They're real small. They shot them from the back of a horse, okay? Uh, a lot of technique in that, just making the bow, learning how to make it shape, bend right, and find the center point, everything. One thing is another unique style. Comanches only knock one side of the bow because when they were on a horse and their bow was 
didn't have a string on it, they could reach down and just pop it in. In order to pop it in, you just had one knock on it, and it would it's easier. Now, if you got two, you're trying to put it both in, like too much trouble. Pull it up and let it pop, you're ready. Now, the other technique is, the reason they do that is, um, it pulls the string to one side, okay? The, see that string comes to the side, okay? What that does, then you have a straighter shot come out the side of your bow. If it was down the center, then your your arrow would you know be off like this if it was down the center. But by pulling that string on the side, you get a straighter shot. That's how you do it. That's the other reason. Technology. These guys brought thought of stuff. Like, how do they do that? You know? So you find most command you build, they'll have a one knock. And uh, it brings the string to both side, one side. Makes it easier. So. <clears throat> I've got a... These are a bunch I make. Like I said, I, I cut them and uh, I cure them out and I work on them later as I got time. So it works out pretty nice. That um, I try to keep them bundled so they all stay straighter, they pull against each other. Then you don't get them bent all the time. So always bundle them when you get started. <clears throat> this is one, this is a old bow. You, if you look at it, it's it's shiny. It's um, it's a lot of oil in it. I got lucky. I was in Wisconsin. The Indians up there hunt bear, so I would trade, and I'd use bear grease. And this one was rubbed down bear grease. I brought bear grease home. I still had some in the fridge after a couple of years. When they render render it down, it doesn't have a smell. And it stays for a long time. It doesn't have any smell to it. I just rub it down. But that's what the old guys use with bear grease. So, and you were talking about how do they, when back then they didn't have sandpaper. And I asked uh, ask them, well, how do you smooth that out? They said, well, we don't have sandpaper. They would use like a, a horn, you know, rub it down. This is my nephew's knife. But what they would do is, to get those shavings, though, they would. It, it was like you had that. Uh, what do you call it? That little draw thing. But the same technique. They would just take a straight knife, and they would take those little uh, uh, marks out of it, and it just shaves it. So they took a just straight knife, and that's how this is made. Just like that. I just sit there one day, just kept taking all those little grooves out, sharpen it. That's what it come out to be. That's a nice little bow. Like I said, this is probably 18 years. I still I still shoot this one. Um, when I make the bow string, I'll have to teach Richard that, but I, in the beginning, that's how they taught me. It was how to braid it and make it. But when you get rawhide or sinew, what happens when it rains? You get moisture, it stretches. Well, you don't have a bow that's any good. So, and I make so many, like, I got to find something else. So I started looking around, and I said, hey, if I got some sinew that I used to tie on the, the arrows with, I would get that. And it's uh, this material here. Now, when you buy it, there's two different kinds that I get them out of Tandy. One is called round. And the other one is flat. So there's two different styles. The round one I use for the bows. What I do is to make a bowstring for this uh, size, I'll get 12 yards. Just pull off 12 yards, okay? And then I put it on a hook and then double it, okay? And I used to just braid it and twist it. I said, damn, they gotta be a faster way. I need 10 of these. So I got a drill, put a hook on it. So I tied it together at one end and turned it clockwise. It spun 
and started to come out like this. What I did to keep that shape, then I put beeswax on it, rubbed it down, and then I got a piece of leather, and they call it burnishing. You take that leather, because you, when you rub something like that, it gets hot, it melts that wax into it. So I would do that, double it, wax it, run it, you know, rub it down. Okay, to make it stronger, I would double it again. Take the one on this, the drill, take it on the other one, hook it again, then I would spin it counterclockwise. Same thing. Twist it to where you think it, you want it. Wax it, burnish it again. You got a string. Now, I've you, I've seen how you tied shears. It's a beautiful ones, but I wanted to keep it rustic, so I just tie a knot in it and I wrap it. I just wrap that on, and it keeps it from, because this uh, rubs all the time, and then I keep waxing this every once in a while to keep your bowstring. But I've put up. 50, 60 pound pool after I made it like, like that, they don't break. I haven't had one break. Not if you wax it and rub it down and work it together. The easy way to do, but it took me years to learn how to do that. It worked out great though. <clears throat> now for, I make all kinds of old bags. I made those old styles where they got the, you know, the longer case for them those are beautiful too but then sometimes you know they just want them flashy so i'll make this one well this is a guy his horse passed away he said i want to keep it so i'll make your arrow bag with him so it's his horse so i, I got to get it back to him but yeah that's what he wanted these was his family colors that he wanted and i just decorated but when I make it like this, all these fringes and things like that that you have, and then the, uh, the strap, it takes a whole deer hide. I mean, a whole deer hide to cut all this. And they're not cheap anymore. They're over $200 a piece. One thing I kept looking at, too, is uh, in the beginning, I wanted to uh, find an old style. So if you look at some of the old pictures, they have bobcat by hides or cougar or whatever but an old man had these he said i i thought about you i want to give you something so you could see i just took this guy's ears but he he called it stove pipe they don't cut it down the belly they pull the whole thing off and so it leaves me a place for my arrows to go here works out great I just put little grommets up here for his eyes and kept his whiskers and his tail. And, uh, of course, Central Horse People, you know, I keep uh, just, I start about putting beads on it. Ah, it doesn't look good yet, but that's how I just worked it out. Just a, so it's a one of a kind There's, that I made. I got one more hide. I'm going to have to make another one. I don't know what I'm doing with it. One guy offered me $800. Oh, I can't get rid of it. It's only one, you know? It's like you got something. I don't want to get rid of it. But you make them all the time. Hey, you make them, you got to sell them. That's why I don't have a lot of stuff sometimes. Is uh, another tool you were talking about uh, straightening the arrows. Do I have one? Yeah. This other tool is it's just a groove, a bone. And you can, that's how you straighten them. You can turn it, and it's easier on your hand. But the other way you would do it is you would look down it and bend it where the like this. That's all. If you, you got real arrow makers, they're always straightening their arrows. They're always sitting there looking at it. Yeah, they want them to shoot good, you know. But uh, that's the way you do it. And I tried uh, making, I made some that are, uh, well, I don't, I think we brought them, but cedar, cedar shafts are good. And my brother even did that. He said, I got some cedar shafts I made arrows out of. He said, but I go back to the ones that you made because they're lighter and stronger. He was shot like crazy with, you know, the regular dogwood arrows. So I'm a, I'm a believer on that. But you got to cure them, let them dry, and then, you know, put the groove in them. So that's what we're doing. Um, let's see what else I need to show you. Oh, feathers. 
I was up in uh, Wisconsin one time. And I cut so many feathers. Matter of fact, when I got married, I was always in trouble because I would uh, have a session where I'm cutting feathers. I got feathers all over the house, okay? So what I would do, I made a pattern for that I wanted and put them on uh, the feather I was cutting. And you just put them on, strap it down, and put a piece of masking tape on the other side, okay? And it, it, keep it keeps it in place. Once you get that masking tape on the other side, you just cut it off, cut to your pattern. I'm sitting there, I can make hundreds now. Where, and then you're more consistent. Of course, if you, put, if you put them on and try, you know, cut them like they would do, but they're more consistent if I use a pattern. But then I was also telling guys that I, guys that make bustles, they want to cut the ends of them. He said, man, I, I keep, keep them straight. It keeps moving. I said, get some masking tape, put it on the back with your pattern, cut right along. I said, then you're moving to the next feather. He come back later, that's a great idea. And my wife's not mad either. I don't have feathers all over the house. But it's just techniques you learn as you go how to make things and it works out great so thank you very much for coming any questions do you want to come up there and look at our stuff that'd be good appreciate it i like your information we're going to have to set some day some afternoon i did it a couple a couple weeks ago young guy was making bows and arrows he seen my video and uh, he invited me over and we sat there all afternoon just to talk about bows and arrows, looking at his stuff, and he asked me how I made this and that, and uh, worked out great. But it's what you do, share with what you're doing with each other. It's that uh, I haven't made uh, effort to make many bow and arrow shot, you know, uh, programs, like the one in Anadarko coming up in November. I hope I can make that, that'd be good. But if you had a chance, look at my videos, uh, is it, what is it? Just Tulsa Library? It's just the interest, you know, that's coming up now with, uh, with the movie The Sun. Then also I got credit in Predator, the one come out. Uh, they wanted information on bows and arrows, so they gave me a little credit about this long, but it doesn't bother me. But I make them for different movies and stuff. A what now? The arrow, the yeah. Feather, yeah. It's not all the way glued down, but it's still loose in the middle. Yeah, that's it's because they didn't have glue, and you pulled it. They didn't put glue on. They yeah. did have horse, you know, hooves or buffalo hooves. They'd make glue, but a lot of times they would just tie them down and they still shot. They, they, they don't affect the no, 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 no. I I still shoot those, and they're okay. Um, what you're going to find out, too, is uh, when you're making your feathers, always use all right wing or left wing feathers. Because what it does, if it's right or left wing, if you look at these feathers closer, they all bend like this. And if you got them all bent like this, that's the way it's going to spiral. Now, if you got one like this, and on the other side, you got one that bends the other way, your feathers gonna kind of flop in the air. It's interesting. Did you ever see a sh um, slow motion of an arrow being shot? It doesn't go straight. 
it comes out and it's flopping all over and all of a sudden it catches up and goes. I did one for Potawatomi and one guy, I want to film it in slow motion. He did that and we looked at it like, how does that shoot straight, you know? It just comes out and it's all over the place, but it straightens up and goes. So I like making these uh, buffalo bones, they look prettier. Besides, I can charge more for them too. <laughs> Say that again. The feed on the arrow from shooting from the bow. Uh huh. How fast is it? Oh, I don't get into that kind of stuff. I just, you know, go by pounds of the pull. That's about it. But yeah, there's, uh, you can look it up and they give technology on that stuff on speed. I did see one video. They shot a old sage orange bow and another one made out of the same material. Osage Orange shot a faster arrow than these other bows. It does, it just, it's a springier wood. Because the old guy said, you gotta be careful when you're splitting it. He said, man, sometimes it'll kick back, you know? You gotta be careful. So it's a beautiful wood to use, but man, it's hard to work. That's why I can't get these younger ones interested Oh, they're all gang ho about making a bow and arrow. By giving a piece of wood and start working on it, they quit. Like, what happened? Man, I've made money off of this. I made big bucks, you know. Um, your bows and arrows can go arrows of probably forty to eighty dollars. Depends. My bows are around three hundred to six hundred. And then if you get an arrow bag like this, you know, you got $200 for just the hide. This cost me $40, then you know, all the materials. You're talking, you know, two, almost $300 of materials. They want it for $400. Like, I'm not making $100 off of this, you know, after hours. Then you just don't find bobcat hides anymore. So, but, you can make them and I make them sell them all the time. I'm probably backed up 30 orders, bows and arrows, because people want one guy wanted in Australia. Like, How am I going to ship this to Australia? It's more, more to ship it than it is to buy it, you know. But it's interesting that they are amazed to see the even the grooves put in a bow. Uh, the guy from England said, we don't do that. I'm going to start trying it. That might make it straighter, you know, keep it straighter longer. But there's techniques, and a lot of guys like the idea. One thing that I'm going to back up and do, and I talked to the library about it, I'm going to do like they have on YouTube. So I'm going to start doing short little sessions. So one, I'm going to show them how to make the point. Get an anvil, make it, and how to make a point. Same way. How to tie the feathers on, that'd be another short one. Another one, how to put the grooves on, that'd be another short one. So it'd be um, just little short sessions people like to be. So it works out, it's been a lot of fun. Only thing, I'm 73, I don't know how long we're gonna do this again, but hopefully next year we can expand on this. I don't know what we can do to get people interested, I wish we really don't. But if it wasn't for bows and arrows, we wouldn't be here. You know, because that's helped us control all of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, because how we dominated. When we were at our glory, it's when the white frontier guys come in, they had single shot rifles. Well, you shoot it, and then you gotta load it, and it takes 45 seconds or a minute. You can shoot five arrows in 15 seconds on a bow. Who do you think is going to win, you know? And we shot them from the back of a horse. They were accurate from the back of a horse. They were. I couldn't believe it. Hanging from underneath the horse. So, yeah, that's why we dominated. And, and the funny part is people didn't know. Before us, the horse was only made or used in battle. They would ride to a fight, jump off and fight. Comanches didn't do that. We rode to a battle and we went through it 
turn around and come back. We were always moving. They didn't know how to handle that. How did they strategize for somebody being so nimble on a horse and shooting so many arrows? So that was uh, my nephew asked me one time, he said, you all see those movies that they got all these arrows stuck all over the place. I said, Comanche, Comanches wouldn't leave no arrows. We need them for the next time. They pick them up and take them, you know, and go again. So, you know, things like that you don't see. And, uh, you know, we, when I have a contest, I do two, two kind. The one, five arrows in 30 seconds hit a target. You still got to score. Oh, probably here's the door. And that's one contest. The other one I like because we were shooting fast. That's way the other. The other one was we put a bale of hay or a target out about 100 yards. You shoot up and come down. Because one of the old guys said when we were fighting cavalry, they were hiding on the other side of the rock. You didn't bounce your arrows off of that. He said, we're shooting up. You them cavalry guys looking up with some arrows to come down behind the rock. They did it like that. You know, but TV, you just, my grandpa would say, when I'm Indians start falling, I'm out of here. <laughs> so, if you get any more questions, let me know. Come on, look at these steps close, please. And uh, got any questions? So, thank you very much. I hope it goes further next year. We'll see. Thanks for coming, Richard. Okay, thank you, folks.